So good morning everyone and welcome to this lecture on the social determinants of health where we'll be looking at the social determinants of health from a global health perspective. The objectives of this lecture are to introduce a perspective on the determinants of health as we see them in global health, to describe what are the major determinants of health, to introduce you to the World Health Organization's Commission for Social Determinants of Health framework, and to outline how understanding social determinants of health is critical to the uptake of maternal health services. I've just taken maternal health services in, as an example, but there are loads of other examples one could actually look at. And how we apply this social determinants of health framework to our example. So a sociological perspective on health. Now, social determinants of health examine the nature of society and social structures and the impact of these systems on various health outcomes. So, for example, in some societies, women face a disadvantage just by virtue of being women. They're more prone to violence. They're more prone to certain illnesses. They're more prone to a number of conditions just by virtue of their gender. And because of the value that society places on women in, in that context. Uh, so gender can be one example of a social determinant of health. The other can be occupation, that people of certain occupational groups face certain variations in health outcome by virtue of that choice of occupation. Uh, immigrants are another group that when you're foreign in a country, the possibilities to integrate or not integrate affect your chances of accessing health care and so health outcomes. So sometimes for us this is a difficult concept to grasp, especially as in the medical prof profession we seem to be very focused on the individual and we're not always aware of patterns and behavior that arise because of the society that we live in or the groups we belong to. So it's important for us to actually stand back a bit and look upstream. Look upstream further back into why is a particular group prone to a particular health outcome. Because none of these health outcomes are biologically determined. Often they are structural in society which means that they can be changed. So... At the beginning of this lecture, it said the take-home message is that health experiences usually tend to be patterned and the way that the society is organized and structured influences people's experiences, their choices, their life chances and so their health outcomes. Social structures and organizations are not fixed, they are not inevitable, natural, biological. They are often the result of the way power dynamics play out in a society and the way society places value on certain groups more than on other groups and, and places less value on certain groups which are more likely to create health inequities. So what do we mean when we say social determinants? So usually whenever we have seen associations between behavior and lifestyle and health, we often try to fix this by fixing the person's decision-making processes. For example, smoking, etc. And these efforts have had limited impacts because you can't just fix behavior. Behavior sometimes stems from certain underlying other underlying conditions which we really need to look into. So we need to go further back, dig deeper, or go more upstream to understand social determinants. As an example here, we look at life expectancy. So life expectancy in Sierra Leone is 34 years, while in Japan it's 82. Similarly, you can look at another health indicator, which is the under five mortality. So in Sierra Leone, it's 316 per 100,000 live births. And in Finland, it's four per 100,000 live births. Now, these differences are not biologically explainable. It's not that human beings in Sierra Leone are different from those in Japan or, or Finland. There are very clear societal and structural reasons for why these differences exist. And so it's differences like this that make us need that make us want or need to question what is happening upstream that contributes to these differences. 
The WHO had set up in 2005 a commission to understand and un address the social determinants of health equalities and that group which is called the Commission for Social Determinants of Health came up with a framework which is called the Commission for Social Determinants of Health Framework which sort of helps us put into perspective the different lines of inequity that contribute to varying health outcomes between different groups or different countries. So they group these determinants into two groups, the structural determinants which in turn affect what's called the intermediary determinants which in turn affect your health outcomes. Now structural determinants are the macro socio-political economic environment which affect your chances of, of, or of opportunity to, do th to have access to healthcare, to have access to education, which affect the way you may be treated as a woman in society, which affect the way you may be treated as an immigrant in society. So these are the macroeconomic social milieu, milieu one can say. Um, it's about what kind of policies that a government enacts to protect the vulnerable, what kind of policies the government enacts to protect those who are foreigners, immigrants in a country, what are societal values that are placed, societal values placed on women for example, are they seen as equal citizens, are they not seen as equal citizens, is there some kind of discrimination. So this macroeconomic context in turn affects your chances of having a good education, of what kind of work you'll do, of where you will live, what kind of income you will have, which in turn affect your day-to-day -day material circumstances, affect your behaviors, affect your access to the health system, which then impact on the kind of health indicators that there are for different groups. So this is the CDSH framework. You can read much more about it in the CDSH report itself, which I've given you a link to at the end of this lecture. Another interesting model to conceptualize the social determinants of health is, as, is what has been given by uh, Dahlgren and Whitehead. And here they look at a num they look at it in an, like in an umbrella fashion where at the outermost ring you have the socio-economic, cultural, environmental, macro socio-economic situation which in turn affects housing, healthcare services, employment, water sanitation, education, availability of food etc. And then under this you also have social and community networks which different groups have and individual, then you come down to individual life fa lifestyle factors which again would affect your health outcomes depending on which group you face, which group you belong to. What evidence is there that social determinants are relevant to health? Actually there is overwhelming evidence. There's a lot of literature that's been published about dirty water, nutrition, sanitation, lack of medical care etc. having an impact. These are factors that do not occur naturally and nor is fixing them just a technical issue. There's a, what we really don't know so much about is how to bring about this effective change. As an example, there's been a lot of work now in India with malnutrition in the under fives because the rates of malnutrition in India in under fives are very, very high, much higher than in much poorer countries. So the point is that it's not just a question of income and there's been recent research actually showing that it's poor sanitation that is related quite strongly to this level of malnutrition in children. And it's the question is now how do we change that because we do not really know how do we actually change these unequal structures. So some of the common determinants of health are poverty, education, sanitation, residence and occupation. There are probably a few more that I mentioned in your textbook but these are the main social determinants of health and it's quite obvious the way these could affect your access to health care and your health situation, your health status. Now coming back to our example on maternal health care, if we were to look at the Indian state of Rajasthan and look at the number of women, the proportion of women who actually had safe deliveries, you can see with time this number rose from 23 to 45%, so it nearly doubled in the decade, which is excellent, fantastic progress. But then if you just look at what these aggregate numbers hide and look at 
<clears throat> the increase for rural women and the increase for urban women. So the blue line is urban and the, uh, the red line is rural. And you can actually see that it went up equally in all groups. But the high access that urban women had in comparison to rural women actually was hidden in the averages. So here we see residence, that is being a rural resident actually reduces your chances of having a safe delivery. So one really needs to look at what is happening in that group and how can we change things for that group with regard to this particular health indicator. Another example from India is actually looking at wealth quintiles in the Indian province of Gujarat among mothers. So if you look, the red and the green are the poorer mothers and the, the light blue, the tall light blue bars are the richest wealth quintile mothers. And you can actually see a very clear gradient. So if you look at the second set of, second clump of bars, which actually looks at mothers who had any antenatal care, you can see a very clear gradient from the lowest to the highest income strata. In the highest income strata, nearly all mothers had some form of antenatal care at 94.1%. But in the lowest income strata, less than half actually had access to any antenatal care. And it's the same if you were to look at the fourth clump of bars, which actually tells you about institutional delivery. What proportion of mothers had access to delivery in hospital? And again, you can see that the richest set quintile of mothers had 88% of mothers delivering in a hospital, whereas the poorest had only 26%. You can look at this slide for a little longer and actually see how well patterned access to healthcare is based on income. So here the line of inequality or the line of inequity is income. In the previous slide, the line of inequity was actually residence. So <clears throat> these are practical examples for you to look at. Uh, and since we're talking about global health, I also thought I should look at and present you an example from the rich world. So this is an example on cardiovascular deaths from the United States in 2007. And if you look at it in the population, for every 100,000 deaths, the rate of cardiovascular is 251 deaths per 100,000 deaths. But if you were to disaggregate that figure and look at it by race, you can see that in African-American men tend to bear the highest burden, much higher than their white counterparts. Similarly, African-American women also have a much higher burden than the overall aggregate and much higher also than white women. So here you can see two axes of inequity operate. One being race. So if you're of African-American descent, you're, likely to, you're more likely to die of cardiovascular death and gender. So if you're a man, you're more likely to die of cardiovascular event than if you were a woman. So this is how, this is an example of the lines of inequity that exist in the rich world as well. The lines of inequity may vary depending on context and that's important to remember. They're very different in different parts of the world. Which brings me to this concept of equity and equality which is a very important notion for us in public health because in public health, equity is always something that is a desired goal as against equality. The difference between the two, in equality, it is that we have a pie and we share it equally among everyone in this class. So if there are 10 of us in this class and we have a pie here, we cut it into 10 equal slices and everyone gets a slice. With equity, we take into consideration the fact that some people's needs may be more than others. For example, if I take an example from Sweden, for example, if we want immigrants to be able to access our healthcare services, we need to have in place for them certain structures that will make it easier for, us, for them to access. So we need, for example, interpreters in the, health, in the healthcare system, which is probably the native Swedish population does not require. So we have to put a little more input of resources. We have to put a bigger share of the resources to allow our weaker groups to also access that care. So this is an example of equity. Equality is if we just had the same health care system open to everyone. Everyone was allowed to use it, but we didn't make any allowance for someone who was weaker than the other to use it. 
So the absence of unjust health disparities between social groups between and within countries is what is equity. It recognizes that inequalities in health exist and adjust for them through social arrangements that reduce the excess burden of ill health among disadvantaged groups. For ex- and the example I gave you was that of immigrants in Sweden, that we have to make extra adjustments for them to be able to access health care so that they don't have extra unnecessary burdens of health care because they were not able to access the health care service system. <clears throat> It's a rights-based approach and it assumes that the standards of health enjoyed by the best of in any group should be attainable by all. So it's very fundamental for you to understand this difference between equity and equality right at the beginning module of this course. The difficult part is that it rarely exists. It is very difficult to achieve equity and access. I think Sweden has been one of the more successful countries in this regard but otherwise it has been rather difficult to achieve equity in healthcare outcomes. So health inequities, you can conceptualize them as unjust inequalities. They're systematic, they're socially produced, they are unfair and they can be remedied. They are not biological. Social inequities in health are directly or indirectly generated by social, economic and environmental factors and structurally influenced lifestyles. At the end is what is a disadvantaged population? So any group in a society that is denied benefits or services because of irrelevant characteristics such as belonging to a particular income, race, religion, because of where they live, ethnicity, etc. And that group is somehow is reflects an absence of capability to achieve health because the structures in society are not in place to enable that group to achieve health. So in, with regard to the social determinants of health and an equity perspective, what we're always trying to achieve is how do we achieve the, the health outcome of the best group in society for this most disadvantaged population. That's where we are heading with this. So to read further on social determinants of health, you can read your textbook, which is by Lin Srandetal. There are probably a few more determinants mentioned there, which I haven't mentioned here, but these are the major ones that you need to be aware of. And here's the website for the WHO Social Determinants of Health where you can actually access, download and read the whole report if you're interested. Okay, thank you for listening.